Well, hello again, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a rainy night. Um, we're going to talk about a topic which uh, I've been interested in for a long time. And that is, um, what is it that makes one aspect of culture or life portable, that is, that it can move around, that it can move, that it can be transferred from one place to another. And what happens when things just can't move? You absolutely can't move them. You, you, in the movement, it would destroy it. So even though I've titled this as for Chinese Buddhist pilgrims, I feel that this is an issue which really is at the heart of how it was that Buddhism was able itself to spread. And it's only as we can try to understand what this fixed and portable means that I think we can come to grips with it. I last night talked to you about Vulture Peak. <laughs> I meant to show you this picture, so I hope you don't mind. I'll just include it. I think this is what Vulture Peak looked like when the Buddha taught on Vulture Peak. <laughs> it was filled with vultures, and the vultures were there to eat the dead bodies. And I show this one because one of the things which is, as Mr. Chen just mentioned, one of the things that influences whether something is portable or fixed is pollution. And one of the worst pollutions that exists is that of dead people. If you touch the dead, it can pollute you in many cultures. And so people want to get rid of the dead as quickly as they can because the dead is considered to be a pollution. The sky burial of the Tibetans, that is, when the Tibetans let the vultures eat a body, the reason for that is that they want as quickly as possible to get rid of the pollution of death by turning it back into life. And how do you do that? You have it eaten by a living animal. The, that bird takes on all of that flesh. It's now living. And when the bird flies up into the air and circles again, it's that wonderful feeling that this dead body is now perfectly purified and the pollution is gone. The Buddha, from the very beginning of his career, taught us that he had no pollution fear of the dead. Because when he took off his princely garments, and we somehow have a feeling that what he did was to strip himself bare. So here's this young man standing out in a field with, he went out to where the corpses were laid, and he stripped himself bare of all the silken garments and the beautiful brocades and the colored cloth that made his princely garments. And he walked among the dead and picked up the rags that had been decaying from the dead bodies. And we're told he picked up 108 of those and tied them together and made his first robe. In other words, there would be nothing more polluting than to go out there with the dead bodies and pick up the cloth that had, they had been wrapped in or clothed in and put it on yourself. In many cases, that would pollute you beyond reason. You would be so polluted that nobody would want to be anywhere near you. But for Shakyamuni, there was no pollution he took that as saying, this is what I do because I want to get rid of all the princely garments 
and I just want to now have an ascetic life. And part of that is that I will dress myself in rags. Not only will they be rags, but they will be from the dead. A lot of people say that this may be where the color of the Buddhist robe comes from that he not only was out in a charnel field with dead bodies, but that possibly he was out there with criminals who had been killed because criminals had to wear a kind of maroon cloth to show them as criminals. So that he not only put himself into a situation of polluting from the dead, but the dead who were evil dead, if you will, and who wore a, wore a color which showed who they were and that was a color that nobody would want to wear because it's a little bit like we sometimes put stripes on, at least in the movies, <laughs> convicts wear striped outfits and nobody wants to wear that because it would look like you escaped from jail. So <laughs> the Buddha in this way in a sense said, I am not susceptible to pollution. I am free from it. I am totally free from any pollution fear. And it was that freedom from pollution fear, which I believe was the very beginning of the spread of Buddhism. That from that very moment, Buddhism was destined to be a portable tradition. We have many examples. Take the example of Ambekar. Ambekar belonged to the Dalit caste in India, that is the untouchables. That's not only out of caste, but it's untouchable. A good Brahmin would feel that if a Dalit walks by them, still today they feel this, there's recently been a huge outcry in India because one of the, some of the Dalit young men have said, we want to be Brahmin priests. And the government has allowed it. And so the Brahmins went on a hunger strike, the others, to say, you can't do this. This is, this is to pollute. These people are ritually polluted because they're, they were born polluted. So poor Ambekar, he, talk, he writes about his situation. He said, I went to the best schools. I trained to be a lawyer. I went to Oxford. I not only got a degree, I got a first class degree. And then he came back to India and expected people to welcome him with open arms and say, how wonderful. Somebody from India has gone to England and got a first class degree, and now he comes home to serve his people. But instead, they all said, you're untouchable. We can't work with you your shadow would fall on us. If your shadow falls on us, we'll be polluted. You're ritually impure just by your birth. Well, he was furious. You can imagine, after all that effort and all he had done to go home and have them say to him, because of who you are by birth, you're not worthy, no matter how much degree, how many degrees you have, or how much intellect you have, or even how much you contribute. We don't care. You're polluted. Forget it. And so he said, at that moment, he decided to stop being a Hindu. He said, I will no longer practice Hinduism. And he looked around and he said, but there is an Indian tradition which says I am not polluted. 
There is an Indian tradition that says, I'm all right, and that's Buddhism. And we have discarded Buddhism in India, he said, but I want to go back and pick it up again. And so he called a meeting of the Dalits. Thousands of people came, and he announced to them, I am converting to a Buddhist this day. Who wants to join me? And thousands joined him that day. So probably one of the major new religious traditions in India is the Neo-Dhamma tradition of Ambedkar, still thriving. It grows, it's been growing rather rapidly, and non-Dalits, that is untouchables, are now joining the Neo-Dhamma tradition. Indian youth and others who have decided that they agree with Ambedkar. They don't want to be a Hindu anymore. <laughs> they're, going to move, they're going to move over to the composite competition. <clears throat> well, it was very different for other people in the Indian tradition. The Jain monks, for example, you see them with the face mask on, so you think, ah, they have a cold. <laughs> but that's not the case. They are the most pollu pollution-sensitive group there is. A giant monk can never stay pure. <laughs> so they put a mask on so they won't breathe in a bug. So they won't inadvertently kill an animal that's flying by and gets into their mouth. And they, when they, they can't ride on a vehicle because they will kill little tiny ants and creatures with the wheels of that vehicle. They can't ride on an animal because that animal will step and kill something. Instead, they themselves have to carry a very soft broom and sweep two feet in front of them so that they see that there's no living creature there, and then they take a step. And then they sweep, 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 and they take a step. These people are fixed. They can't travel. They can't travel. They can't, they can't get on an airplane. They can't get on a train. They can't even walk so that the pollution fear they have is that if I kill something, I'm going to have such bad karma that I will not be able to achieve enlightenment. So what's the best life that you can lead? Starvation. So a good giant monk will eventually starve themselves to death and people will come from miles around to be there to watch them at the last moment because there is the purity of that. The Jains are very pure people, wonderful people. I, I like them very much. They became, have become the diamond merchants of the world because they feel that diamonds are some of the most purest things you can handle. A diamond is Polished diamond is pure for them, so they can handle it. It's all right to handle it. But they can't, when they move, have a priest go with them. They can't have a giant monk or nun go to Antwerp, where the di diamond industry is in Europe. They can't have giant monks or nuns come to Los Angeles, where they have a community. Because if they did, they would be ritually polluted and impure. So consequently, they would do you no good. So you wouldn't accept a giant monk or priest who had traveled. In other words, this group became fixed in one way. And they have become a caste of their own. And consequently, they really put pressure on people to marry within that group. So they're a good example. The Brahmin, 
you can't really be converted to Brahmanism. You can't be, in that sense, converted to Hinduism in the eyes of most people because you must be born into a caste. Just by your birth, it says who you are and what you are. So if you're born from Brahmin parents, it's by birth that you get your spiritual superiority. It's just by birth. So when the recent event in uh, uh, Karnika, where the government decided that we've done away with the caste system in India. And if we've done away with it, we have all these bright young Dalits, like Ambakar was, and we're going to let them become Brahmin priests. And so you can imagine the furor of the people who fear the pollution of these people. It's pollution. So, back to our main topic of pilgrimage. I introduced that introduction to just let you know that while we are dealing with the issues of all of that fixed and portable sanctity, uh, just keep it in mind as we go through the rest of the lecture, whether or not there is something which keeps you from doing something. There is some block that says you can't do that. <laughs> you can't move, you can't take a step because of pollution fears. But portability of religion is not just from pollution. Portability of a tradition, particularly with regard to mountains, is the question of I go to Wu Shan. It's really special. When I'm there, I feel the power of this place. And so a Japanese monk who went there and studied then went home. And he was going back to Kyoto, a Tendai monk, and he was going back to Mount Hiei in Japan. And he said, I have to take this sanctity with me. There's something so wonderful about this place, this Wu Tai Shan. I, I need to take it to my mountain in Japan. I've got to transfer this power. So he filled 20 bags with dirt from the mountain. And he carried it back to Mount Hiei near Kyoto and spread it on the ground because he was moving the power of Wu Tai Shan to Japan. And up thereafter, he felt that the power of that magical power he felt from Wu Tai Shan was now present in his own Mount Hiei, which is a, a nice enough mountain, but it's dull by comparison to Wu Tai Shan. You can understand why he came from just a regular old mountain with trees on it and went to Wu Tai Shan and saw these fantastic configurations of rocks and spires. So you try to say, in one sense, that portability, but in another sense, it's fixedness. It says that this mountain has in its very soil power. And so consequently, since it's in the soil, you can gather that soil, you can move the soil because it's got it fixed in it. It's there and you can carry it wherever you want and you spread it around and you have carried the power from one place to another, portable. But the power itself in one sense is fixed in the soil itself. You can see that issue. So when people look at great mountains or particular issues, 
um, in my family, we feel that where we live, there is a mountain that has power. It's called Mount Shasta. It's a volcano. And it's massive. And it's it is the case. When, when you're there, almost everybody feels it, that you just are transported by being near that mountain. When you walk up to it and you start to climb it, something about that mountain just affects everybody. I've never yet known somebody who could look at that mountain and not be awed by it. So, if I wanted to take that mountain, and I've watched people who are hiking there, how many people pick up part of it and take it home with them. They just can't stop it. It's like this sanctity which is fixed in this soil, this mountain, I want it for myself. So that Wu Tai Shan got transported so Wu Tai Shan is now part of Mount Hiei in Japan. And it's both fixed and portable. The Koreans did one better. They said, we're not going to just take six or 20 sacks of dirt and scatter around. We have this wonderful mountain in Korea and we think that this mountain we have in Korea is Mount Wu Tai Shan that flew to Korea and is, it is here. This is Mount Wu Tai Shan. So they named it Ode San, which in Korea is Wu Tai Shan, the five terraced mountain. And people go there because they feel this is where Manjushri lives. This is, I don't have to go to China. The mountain flew here. As I said last night, when I run across local lore like this, I don't want to just throw it away. I want to consider it very carefully. What they're saying is that the power which I see in one place, when I feel the presence of similar things in another place, how do I explain that? Why is it that Odesan also feels special? <clears throat> and it does. And they said, well, the answer is, it's because it is Wu Tai Shan. It's not like to, it's not that we've named our place and it's just a name. It's considered to be the actual mountain that has flown in the air and landed there. So that's portability and fixity at the same time for mountains. And so in Korea, thousands of people make pilgrimage to Odesan, just as thousands of people in China do it to Wu Tai Shan. And they feel, if I go to Odesan, I don't have to go to Wu Tai Shan. <clears throat> There's another kind of portability. And this portability became very important for the spread of Buddhism and very important on the mountains. When the Buddha passed away into Nirvana, he said to one of the people who was caring for him at the very end, here's what I want you to do. This body is finished. I want you to burn it, cremate. And I want you to take the ashes and I want you to put them at a crossroads and cover it with a mound of earth. So they cremated him. And they started to take them to um, 
put them in. And then an argument arose. We all want some of it. We want some of this leftover body of the Buddha. And so we are told in the text that armies came to say, we're coming to get a part of this body. When you, when you cremate, um, I, I was looking and studying relics at one time, so I went to a, a funeral home and talked to the funeral director who did cremations. So I said, people take the bones, the teeth, they take the parts of the body that are left after cremation, they make them into relics, but there's quite a bit left. And he said, you'll never find that with what I do, because if you burn in a fire, you can only get to a certain temperature. You cannot burn a body totally. You can't burn bones. Very hard to do that. But because I have this electric thing, which gets to over 2,000 degrees in temperature, there's nothing left but just fine dust. There are no bone fragments really left, if it works right. The teeth, everything has been gone. But since the Buddhist cremations were not so hot, people would began to dig in the ashes immediately after cremation to see what was left and to get a piece of the body. Why would you want it? From one perspective, when Buddhism came to China, one of the things which upset a lot of the Chinese was that they brought these bones of dead bodies. They brought Buddhist relics. And people began to say, what are you doing carrying around the bones of dead people? You're going to pollute yourself. Didn't Confucius say not to have anything to do with the dead? What are you doing with these, these bones? So in Korea, I've watched this through the years. <clears throat> um, cremations that, like this with wood is very expensive. Not everybody can do it. It's too expensive. So only special monks or special person is now burned in a wooden pyre like this. But after it's over, they have these long chopsticks, like a tweezer, and they dig through the ashes and look for the relics. And what they find are little fragments that look like molten glass. It's, it's melted. You can tell it's melted, and it's shiny, black, opalescent color. And so you dig through looking for those because you want them. They're considered to be, they carry, just like the dirt that people carried from Wu Tai Shan to Mount Hie in Kyoto, those relics still have the power of the person that was cremated. Well, I had a friend who <laughs> told me, he said, <clears throat> they, came, they were wealthy enough that when his grandmother died, she said, I want to be cremated. I want you to burn me with wood. And so they did. And then somebody in the family said, well, while we've done this, we ought to look to see if she had any relics. And he said they all kind of snickered and thought, well, she was a little hard to get along with. <laughs> I don't know that she's going to have very many relics. But lo and behold, she had 150, which is way up the scale in terms of people who are considered to be enlightened. And so they changed their mind about their grandmother. They said, we never knew how enlightened she was. 
We never knew what a special person she was until we looked at the number of relics that she left after her cremation. <clears throat> well, sometimes it gets to be a little scary because <clears throat> when a really popular and famous monk is cremated, everybody holds their breath. Will there be a lot of relics to show that this person was, in fact, an enlightened person? <laughs> or sometimes they don't find any, and then they feel that that person, we were wrong about them. So when one of their most famous monks passed away and was cremated, there was a great sigh of relief throughout the whole nation, because when they went through his ashes, they found or almost 200 relics. And they all could say, yes, well, of course, we all knew. He was a very special person. And now we have proof from this. So the Buddha was cremated, and he left behind relics. And people fought over those relics. And we have from very early artistic representations, the fact that you burn and then you put the relics in a mound. The fact that everybody wanted a part of those relics was based on the Prajnaparamita literature and later literature. It says, why should you like the relics of the Buddha? What is it that makes these physical remains of his burnt body so absolutely important? And the text says, he became fully enlightened. And because he became fully enlightened, his whole body was enlightened. So therefore, when you look for relics that you want to revere, you want somebody who has become fully enlightened. Because that enlightenment is still present or fixed in that physical remain. And so everybody wants to have a part of that. They don't want to lose all of that power which was created by this person who achieved a state of enlightenment. So the armies that came, was, uh, they took relics away. Um, then the question was, does it matter how big it is? How much of a relic, how much of a piece of bone do you have to have to have the power of this person? And so the answer was that because the power is so great, you need something that's no bigger than a mustard seed. That is a tiny, tiny little flake. That's all you need. It's like holographic. And that tiny little thing is the whole thing. Now later on the mountains in China, particularly at Zhuhuashan, they said that they wanted the whole body relic, not just a little piece. And so they began to create mummies. They mummified the famous people. And they did it in several ways. <clears throat> um, of course, in the Taoist tradition, they had what were called um, kind of natural mummies that the people had eaten a special diet. Everything was so that when they died, their body desiccated, but it didn't just decay, and there was no odor. The Buddhist followed suit by helping to make mummies, and in, in one way, it depends on when a person dies. We know now from out west in China 
that there are a lot of mummies they have discovered and they've dug them up several times. For a while it was a sort of money maker. You allowed scholars to come in and dig for mummies and then you put them back in the ground and the next group of scholars came and got to dig them up again. But once people found that out, then they lost their business. But they understood one thing from those mummies, and that is if the death occurs in the height of winter, the body placed outside freeze dries, and the mummification comes from being freeze dried, just as you would if you were trying to freeze dry food. You do it quickly, it's really cold, and it desiccates the body. So those who die in the winter and get freeze dried, their bodies, their mummies last the longest. If you don't have the freeze dried and you live in southern China where it's never going to get that cold, then they used lacquer and they put lacquer strips. And as the body expanded or the gases got greater, you just keep adding lacquer strips until the mummies are almost like caskets of lacquer, more than a, phys you don't see the body anymore. So on the mountains, they had both relics in stupas and they had full body relics as mummies present. And they wanted both because both contain this great power because the people they were working with were people who were so special that you want to hold on to that power. So in a wood fire burning, this is pretty much what comes out. And that's probably pretty much what existed in the past. And it's fragments of bones, it's teeth. Um, and some people feel that the body is also filled with stones, kidney stones, gall stones. And when those burn, or get, they may melt, and you find them. Um, so people take these, um, they are distributed often to lay people. Special lay people get a little bit of the master's ashes. That's often the case. I have a friend who is Japanese and when his master died, he got a little fragment of his body that was left over and he would never fly on an airplane without putting it in a belt around his middle. That was his protection for taking a flight. So I always liked to fly with him because I thought, yes, he's got this wonderful protection. <clears throat> well, the armies came and they distributed the relics. When the World Buddhist Forum was here in Hong Kong, a few years ago, you may have remembered this, um, Air China flew a relic of the Buddha to Hong Kong airport and transported it to the conference center down on the wharf for our forum, World Buddhist Forum. And so in the hall, there were about 5,000 people in the hall. Uh, we stopped talking and we just watched a video or a television camera display of the relic being put on a truck. The freeways were cleared of all traffic uh, and the relic slowly moved until it came into the hall and they carried what you see here into the hall and for us all to see. <clears throat> it was very interesting to me that uh, so much effort was put forward to bring a Buddha relic to that meeting. And yet, nobody said anything about it. 
So on the last day, when we were getting ready to have the closing ceremony, one of the organizers came up to me and said, you got to tell us why we have this relic. <laughs> <laughs> so we've given you five minutes, and you've got 10 minutes before you're on. <laughs> and you got to tell us, what is this? What is this all about? Why should we think this is important? Somebody needs to say something about it because we put all this effort out and nobody has even mentioned a word except at the time when it arrived and people said, isn't this wonderful, we have a relic. And I had to think quickly, which is hard for me. I'm a slow thinker, but I finally realized something about relics that day, which I believe is true. And that is, a relic has nothing to do with any kind of sectarian division. A relic is something which anybody can revere. You can have people from every form of Buddhism. As we did at the conference, people did go in to do reverence in front of the relic. I think that early Buddhism was a relic cult. And that what held Buddhism together at the very beginning of itself was the fact that they had the relics from the Buddha's cremation and they put them in mounds, which they later covered in brick and made into beautiful, as we'll see, beautiful structures. That they had something which they all could go to. And that these relics emanated power. So you wanted to be in the presence of this relic. So somebody has said in the, in the Frederick Paramita again, you have the idea of what's called good sons and good daughters. It's just a word for Buddhist. Those who were lay followers of Buddhism, good sons and good daughters. And that one of the ways to define those were people who went to stupas. There was no other structure or no other organizational pattern. So they went to the stupa and those stupa activities in one way may have constituted almost the totality of early Buddhist ritual and activity. The founder was gone, his disciples were left, they could teach, people could go to them and listen to them teach. They did not yet have monasteries. Uh, they were not yet sure that this thing is going to survive as an organization. You know, you have to remember the Buddha was not a Buddhist. Buddhism did not exist as such. So the relic became a way to get anybody, no matter who you were, you could come from miles around to a stupa and revere it. And you didn't even have to know anybody else who was there. And nobody told you what to do. And nobody told you not to do it. It was, a it apparently was an open-ended kind of folk tradition which grew up based on those relics. So part of the portability of Buddhism was the fact that they had relics. They not only had the relics, but the relic had its power so fixed in it that you could put them anywhere. And when you put a relic somewhere, it emanated power, and that spot became sacred. So when you look at the mountains in China, one of the things that we know is they had relics. They had stupas. They had this idea of the importation and the placement of something that was inherently sacred that you could put and everybody would come and have part of it. 
I said that early Buddhism was, I think, a relic cult. The early Buddhists did not have images. They did not have images of the Buddha. It was like this. They had stupas, but they had no images on them. The earliest stupas that were built, and they were magnificent, after a while, this one is, is carved out of stone, and pillars are carved out of stone to look like they're almost made out of wood. And there's <clears throat> rafters up above, but they're all rock, living rock. But there's not an image in sight. And that tells us that the relic comes first, and only later does Buddhism develop the idea of the power of an image. And the whole process by which imagery was given power came by first having images with holes in them so you could put a relic in there. And if you didn't put a relic in the image, it had no power. A lot of people don't know this, but in Christianity, uh, for example, the Episcopal Church, the Church of England, every Church of England church has a relic. You cannot consecrate a Church of England or Pres Episcopal Church without a relic. It's hardly talked about, but it's, it's part of the practice in order to make this place special. I believe that the Buddhists invented the relic practice. I think this is something which Buddhism introduced into the religious world. Certainly people believe that the bones of your ancestors could be important. That was worldwide. But to create the idea that you could have a ritualized organization based around the bones of the dead, and that these were people from everywhere could go to those bones and have a religious practice and ritual. <clears throat> Confucius once again said to people, you must never go to somebody else's tomb and do a ritual. You must only do it for your family. You have no right to do a ritual for somebody else's family. And so that was why it was a death offense at one time in China to claim that a boy was your son if he was not your DNA son, because your ancestors would have somebody feeding them who was not a part of their lineage. And it would be, they would cause terrible trouble because they wouldn't like it. But the Buddhist said, anybody, any strangers, people from a thousand miles away can come to the relic of the Buddha and it's okay. And so on the mountains of China, they really introduced a whole different feeling about how you treat and revere the dead. That you could revere somebody who was not your ancestor, a bodhisattva, a great monk, a great master, the Buddha. Even if you weren't related to them, they were still there available for you to do that. So Buddhism now with the relic had broken away from the idea that they were only limited to the Gangetic Plain. They could take their relics anywhere in the world. And not only that, but they could take them and say to anybody, anywhere, you can come to this place and revere this relic and practice your tradition and your faith. So the portability of Buddhism was in many ways dependent upon relics. Stupas abound. They are everywhere in Buddhism. 
Um, they are all kinds of things. For example, on the bottom over there, um, the great stupa in Yangon, or Rangoon as it used to be called, um, it's not to a cremated relic. It's unusual. It's to two hairs of the Buddha, which the first merchants who found him sitting under the tree just after his enlightenment found two hairs that had fallen from him. And they picked them up and treasured them because, again, it was the power of the body of this enlightened person, and they had it. And the, this becomes the content not only of the, of the huge stupa in downtown Yangon, but in Sri Lanka, they also have a place where the same merchants were supposedly left the two hairs and they have a huge stupa to them as well. That tells us several things, I think. Number one is that Buddhism was always being spread by merchants. Merchants were a part of the Buddhist world. And that part of that spread of the Buddhist world is that they found something which was portable. And that was a portable part of the body of the Buddha who was a fully enlightened one. And in every pore and every hair of the body of that fully enlightened one was the power of enlightenment. And so you could carry it anywhere and you could build huge structures over it. And you could create a Buddhist tradition as we, as we see it in the world just based on those relics. So the portability of relics became for Buddhism a way for it to spread. And without the relic tradition, I don't know what Buddhism would have been like. It is hard to imagine what they would have substituted for the relics to hold them together not only to hold them together, but to have a place of ritual, to have something you could carry anywhere and put it down and immediately have power in that place. The relic was a fantastic instrument. <clears throat> when I tell people who are Christian that I think the Buddhists were the ones that introduced to Christianity relic cult activity, they don't like it. They like to feel that it's theirs, and that's fine. But I have to remind them, they may not know, they sometimes don't know, what were the first recorded Christian relics? And the first recorded Christian relics were those of Thomas, who had died in Goa in India and somebody brought his relics from Goa in India to Syria, and people revered them. And the, re the relic tradition of Christianity, from all the historical records that we have, whatever they're worth, indicate that it came from India. And I believe that's so. Nowhere else do we find this very careful method of preserving the relic and using it as a way to spread the tradition. When we look in some relics, as I pointed out last time, some of the stupas, like the one in Kathmandu, represents an event. It's not so much, it marks that place as being special because something happened there. So instead of using the relic to empower the place, it's the story of what happened there. So that's why when Manjushri finds a lotus growing in the lake at Kathmandu, 
That's where you build a stupa. It was special. Sanchi is uh, one of the most beautiful of the reconstructed Buddhist. This comes from the time of Ashoka. It's a series of stupas. So it tells us that you start out with a mound of earth, you put some rocks up first, then you put a layer of brick, and then <clears throat> you put another layer of brick, and then you make a structure over that, and you make a structure over that, and you make another structure over that, and then you put a fence around it, and you put a gateway, and over time, you develop that place until it becomes this fantastic structure for people to come from everywhere. Someone has studied Sanchi graffiti. People just cannot keep from scratching things on stone. And they scratch their initials or they scratch their names. And so people who have come as uh, pilgrims to Sanchi have left their names and left their place of origin. So somebody has looked at all that graffiti to say, where did they come from? They came from Myanmar, they came from Thailand, they came from Nepal, they came from Sri Lanka, they came from the Buddhist world far distant to that stupa because they knew it. That's why I say the stupa keeps on functioning as a kind of cement between disparate groups of Buddhists. They can still come to this place and there they are all together. Ashoka built this stupa. It was uh, at the home of his wife, her hometown, that was Sanchi. And he built it at a crossroads. And you can see through the stories how there's a continuation of ideas of what do you do with these relics? <clears throat> In modern time, uh, a group came to Master Xing Yun at Foguanchan, and they gave him a relic, a very well-attested, long-time relic that had been present, and that was a, they considered it to be um, a, almost a kingly gift. Well, Master Xing Yun is a very interesting man because he, when he, he has visionary ideas. And he looked at that relic and he said, this is really important. How in the world can you show the importance of this relic? How in the world can you let the world know that we've got this fragment of a completely enlightened being present with us. And so he took a 100 acre plot of ground at Kaohsiung and built what's now called the Buddha Museum. It used to be called the Buddha Memorial. I think they should have left the name as Buddha Memorial because it is built to house this relic. That's what it's for. That was its original thing. As time goes by, I think people will forget that. It'll be a museum, it'll be a place to go, it'll, it'll be, a, you can do pilgrimage there, it's a place where uh, Master Xing Yun will leave his relics. Um, but that's what it is. This is a modern way of handling a relic. And it's huge. <laughs> And it has become the number one tourist attraction of Taiwan. And this is one of, in the top 10 of the world's museums now in terms of attendance. They have millions of people who come every year to this museum, this place of a relic. So this just is an indication of how we think we look back in history and everything is what happens a long time ago. But here is something which is happening 
in our own time. <clears throat> then we go to Horyuji. This is one of the oldest monasteries in Japan. And what we find at Horyuji, I think, needs to be looked at very carefully because you find the pagoda instead of the stupa. But the pagoda was just like a stupa. It was built to be put on top of a relic. A pagoda is a reliquary in every instance. So what do we find in Japan in their oldest monastery? They put the pagoda in the very middle. It's the centerpiece. When that was built in the seventh century, we can say that the relic cult is still dominant. It's still there. And behind it is the, basically the library, the Buddhist text. So that by that, that time, we can say that Buddhism has added to the relic function the teaching in written form. And they're put together. And they have a central place. And the monks who live around there and who do their rituals around this area and did that for, for centuries, it's the relic and it's the text so the question is, did the Buddhist think of the actual written text as being a relic? Because when you read the Prajnaparamita literature, you don't get this in the Pali. The Pali never says a word about writing never says a word about writing down the text. But in the Prajnaparamita of Mahayana, writing has been glorified. And they say, hey, look, you can build a billion stupas. But if you just copy one four-line verse of this sutra, you'll get much more merit. That's an enormous shift that's occurring in Buddhism when that text is written. Number one, for the first time it says, we're not an oral tradition anymore. We are now a written tradition. We are literate. And we're writing things down. And that writing in and of itself is sacred. And it's more sacred than a, than a relic that is a part of the body of a fully enlightened one. And why is that? Because what we write down in the Prajnaparamita is the mother of bodhisattvas. The Prajnaparamita is the mother. You go to a Tibetan monastery, anywhere you want to go, and you ask them to see mother. They will take you into their library and they will point to the 600 or so volumes they have of the Prajnaparamita and they said, there she is. That's the mother. And that mother is like the source of power that's in the, in the written word. So when you look at Horiuji and you find the stupa in the middle and you find right behind it the place for the written word, you can already begin to see how you can study a religion by what it is doing in terms of portable sanctity in a way. And I, then the question is going to be, what is portable sanctity when it comes to text? For Buddhism, portable sanctity was you can say the Buddhist teachings in any language. There is no limitation. You cannot do the Vedic tradition in anything but Sanskrit. If you don't do the rituals and everything with the exact pronunciation of the Sanskrit, 
it won't work. It has to be Sanskrit. How many traditions have or fixed with one language? Judaism is fixed with Hebrew. Islam is fixed with Arabic. Their religious documents can be translated, but the translation is not equal to the original language. It's not so for the Buddhist. And why is that? Because the Buddha said, what I teach is just the way things are. There's nothing secret about it. It's the way things really are. And if that is so, if what I'm saying to you is just that's the way things really are, you ought to be able to say that in any language because that's what language does. It describes the world and the way things really are. So you can find, like here, Sanskrit, Koroshti, Tibetan, Chinese, Tonguk. It just goes on and on. Language is not a barrier to the portability of the Buddhist teachings. And that's why <clears throat> on Wutai Shan, for example, we find the Chinese and Tibetan traditions side by side, each with their own text, each with their own rituals. But the message is still portable through whatever ritual, whatever language, and they don't feel that the other person is not doing Buddhism. Even though there are lots of, on the surface, very great differences. So finally, Buddhism began to develop the image. I myself believe that the idea of a portrait three-dimensional image came from the Greeks. It came from the Greeks who were in what's now Pakistan and Afghanistan, the Bactrian Greeks. They put portraits, actual, the way people look, portraits of the kings on coins. And through time, as the king aged, they would change the coin and make the image on the coin, the king as he looked at that time. So you can watch the kings grow older. I worry about that in my old age because I just moved and I found all of my old driver's license. I don't know why I save things and I don't know why I do it. And I look and I watch. <laughs> The years go by, so the images show me that I'm growing older and older. Uh, the kings could look at coins and see themselves. Like Queen Elizabeth has got to watch herself grow older and older and being shown to everybody in the world and all the coins. The Buddhist image was thought to be, and in many cases, the Buddhist images, particularly in the Northwest where the Bactrians were, were like portraits. But the Buddha image was also portable. You could carry a Buddha image anywhere in the world. There is no restriction. Think of all the ones that are made in Myanmar out of that beautiful white marble. They're shipped all over the world to Buddhist sites. You have them here in Hong Kong. You've got them in China. You have them in the US, Europe, Australia. Everywhere I go, I see these white Burmese images. So they're portable. Nobody says you can't do it. Of course, the Thai have worried about people buying Buddha images in order to make them for decoration or just as a souvenir, so they won't let you ship them out. It's an attempt, I understand it. But basically, the Buddha image can be taken anywhere. 
and we can move them around. And the Buddha image uh, is all sizes. Some of them are huge, of course, but you can also have very tiny ones. It doesn't matter. Size, what it's made of, gold, silver, wood. You can do anything you want in one sense because, and that image, once it got started, would come to dominate Buddhism. So if you go to the mountains of China, you don't, you find stupas to be sure, and you find some relics, but what you find big time are Buddha images. Every building is filled with a Buddha image. Uh, it doesn't mean that Buddha images aren't always safe. <clears throat> Periodically, the Chinese, through history we read, the government would decide we need some metal. Where can we get copper? Where can we get alloy? And then somebody said, oh, down there in the monastery, they got those big metal images. So they would melt them down and make coins. So the images would disappear, they would be coins. Then the Buddhists would send out the word, if you want to make a donation, make a donation of a coin. And before you know it, the, the thing had gone the other way. The Chinese would take all of the coins that people turned in, melt them down again, make an image. So they just recycled the metal through the imagery. So the Buddhists, in a sense, became like a bank. Their images were holding on to metal just in case you need it for coinage. You can melt it down and use a Buddha image. But we want the coins back eventually, and we'll put them back into an image. In Hinduism, a Shiva image can never be moved or should never be moved. Shiva is only, you build an image of Shiva only where somebody has seen Shiva appear. And because Shiva appeared at that place, you build an image, but you should never move it. And if you move it, there are stories that Shiva, during the night, will go back to her, his place. And you cannot move Shiva because it's fixed. Christianity had that with the Black Madonna. The Black Madonna was a kind of painting that developed where Madonna is shown to be African in principle, very dark skinned. And if you tried to move a Madonna painting once you had put it into a church, tears would come down the face of the painting and it also would travel back at night to its home. It was like a dog that wants to go home, a cat, any animal wants to go back home. So these images, these things would go back to where they belong. You couldn't just take them anywhere. It just wouldn't work that way. They were fixed. They belonged where they belonged. But because the Buddha images were not fixed, they were portable, Buddhism was able to spread their art and spread their tradition through their images as well as through their relics. Take Avalokiteshvara. It said the first time an Avalokiteshvara image appeared at Puto, a Japanese monk had acquired an image of Avalokiteshvara. We believe in the male gender. When he got to Puto, um, there was no boat. And then there was a boat, but the winds came and the storms came. And he could never seem to leave because it just never was right. And he finally said, aha, I know what it is. Avalokiteshvara doesn't want to leave here. I'll never be able to leave here and carry that image with me. I have got to leave it here. And so people say this is the first time 
that a Guan Yin Avalokiteshvara image was placed at this particular seaport area and the fact that it later became the residence for Guan Yin, some people want to put back to this story. Whether that's true or not, it is an indication though that people also had the feeling that some things you just don't move and some things don't want to move. And if you try, you get run into real trouble and they won't move for you. The other portable thing were monks and nuns. Monks were more travelers than nuns, always. So throughout the trade routes of Inner Asia, we get no pictures of nuns at an early period. We only get monks. The first nuns to be ordained were ordained because they finally got 10 Sri Lankan nuns who came up the Pearl River right here at Hong Kong to Guangzhou. And those 10 Sri Lankan nuns with 10 monks ordained the first Chinese women as nuns. So the Chinese order of nuns is absolutely, from that perspective, authentic. It was double ordination, 10 monks and 10 nuns. They had them. At first they didn't have, because the story goes, they, didn't have, they only had eight nuns because some of the nuns who had come died. They had come by ship. The women did not travel the trade routes of, with the animals and the long journeys. They came by ship. It was probably much safer for them to do that. So they sent a ship. It took two years. The ship sailed from here back to Sri Lanka by the, according to the monsoon wind patterns. Then they had to wait till the monsoon wind patterns shifted and brought them back. And they brought enough nuns. They brought more than two because they were worried about the fact that it, you didn't want anybody to die. So they brought them all, they brought enough that they could do the ordination. So we are, I just today went up to a Juhai College, which is up at the Gold Coast. <clears throat> you know, that's a very famous place in the Buddhist story. That was the fort where all the people going up to Guangzhou had to stop to be checked over because you couldn't just sail all the way up there without going through by that port. So all of the great Buddhist teachers who came to Guangzhou came through here on the Pearl River and stopped at Zhuhai College. That was the fort. And the Buddhist monks of, of renown and those Buddhist nuns probably walked on that soil. That's exactly where they were. So it's Hong Kong really should look carefully at its own Buddhist history, I think. Anyway, the monks in Buddhism were also free to be from anywhere. So when you look at Kizil, which is in the western part of China, uh, at Bezek, this is Bezeklik, not Kizil, this is Bezeklik. These, this painting, you get two foreigners, including a Westerner, red-haired, rather strange-looking, with weird eyes. Um, there was no limitation as to who could be ordained. You didn't have to be an Indian. You didn't have to be anything to be ordained from these pictures. And the Bodhisattva figures that come from Gandhara, that is from Pakistan, uh, were portraits, that's the Greeks. These are Greek-made, Greek-influenced images. They got some young man to come in and pose. That's what you feel. That's a real person's face. That's not just drawing a face that's 
symmetric, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. These are portrait where the individual facial expression is coming through. And these portraits of the bodhisattvas, and we know they're bodhisattvas because they're wearing jewelry, they're princes, they're like princes. And they're some of the most magnificent Buddhist images that we have. I love those Gandharan images. But they are an indication that bodhisattvas were not limited to Indians. <laughs> bodhisattvas were free. Bodhisattvas were portable as well. <clears throat> so today, uh, it's still the case. Monastics can be of all shapes, sizes, races, gender. They're all there. And what I like that's happened in only recent times is that the Buddhists have, are becoming acquainted with each other worldwide. So when you have these big international meetings, they meet each other. They walk together. They all, they don't stand back. It used to be that no monk would sit beside a nun. That's all out. They walk together, they sit, they talk. It's become the portability of the monasticism is more present today, I think, than ever in Buddhist history. We have this. And I love this, the monk, he's a Foganchan monk who is in the Congo. And I always love to talk to him, to ask him, how's it going? You're there in the Congo, for pity's sakes. And he says, I can't keep up with the interest that there is in Buddhism. People love it. Um, I think that we never think about sub-Saharan Africa as being a site for Buddhist activity. But Buddhism, because of its portability, can go there. And you can have an African Congolese monk, no problem. And you can have him participate in the international world as well. So the, this kind of portability of Buddhism is still present with us and still going on. <clears throat> Part of my interest is because I'm working on this project on maritime Buddhism. And these are some of the sites that we're filming for that 3D virtual reality that I hope will open here in Hong Kong in maybe late 2019. But the more I've worked on this project, the more I feel that I can spot that the Buddhist tradition and the portability of it as it spread all the way from India to Korea and to Japan, that watching how it spread is that it has the elements of portability and it's those elements of portability that make it so viable and so function so perfectly. I'm trying to say with my project here, I want to change people's attitude toward the maritime tradition. I want to say to people that if you really study the history of Buddhist, the spread of Buddhism, it was not limited to the land. It didn't all go by camel caravan through inner Asia. More of it than not came by sea and went from seaport to seaport. Buddhism's portability was for the ocean as well as for the land and they went along with the merchants. I used to think, well, how, did, how would you do that? You're, you're a monk or a nun, and you go down to the sea coast and you say, I wanna go to India. <laughs> what did you do? Did you buy a ticket? How did you ne negotiate the logistics and the economics of traveling on a ship. 
And I could never quite understand how they did that because I'm sure they just didn't have the money to pay. And then I read a very interesting study of the people who are on these cargo ships that plow back and forth across the oceans, particularly the Pacific. They carry these from here, coming from Hong Kong, all the way to San Francisco or to Europe. The people who are on those ships, often they're only uh, six. They each, they do two of them at a time, and each one has an eight hour shift. And it's all automated. And they go crazy. They have enormous psychological problems. The loneliness. The, they're usually by themselves almost all the time. I read the story of one of the wives of one of these who decided she'd take the trip with her husband. And she said when she got off, finally after crossing the Pacific, that's it. I will never, ever, ever do this again. It's too lonely. And I think that that was true for these merchants, that the psychological issues which they faced on long ocean voyages, the dangers of falling ill or being killed were so enormous that when a religious person came down to the harbor and said, can I hitch a ride? They opened their arms and said, you bet. Come on board. I need all the protection I can get. I want you to pray for me. I want you to be on this ship because if a really sacred person is on this ship, it's going to be much safer. I'm sure that that's why they were able to travel so, you read all the stories of pilgrims who travel by sea. I'm, I'm, after reading about how hard it is for people who are lonely and out there on the sea, and what do you do if you fall sick and there's no doctor? You can't do anything but just bite your nail and stay with it. <clears throat> And the other thing that was portable was monasteries. I think the Buddhists also invented monasteries. We have nothing like a monastery before the Buddhists had it. From the second century BC, we now say BCE, from the second century, we have archeological evidence of structures near stupas which housed people. The monastery with people living by rule, shaving their heads, practicing celibacy, living a life of spiritual practice was fully in place long before Christianity. The first Christian monasteries were along the Nile River in Egypt. And they were at the point at Luxor where the trade brought from India was brought across the desert and from there floated down to Alexandria. This was a contact place with people who knew all about India. I think without question that probably that development at Luxor of the first Christian monastery of people living together by rule, wearing special clothing, shaving their heads, carrying rosaries. It's just too much to imagine that people would reproduce exactly the same pattern with no imp interchange with people who had already done that. And particularly given the amount of trade and connections that there were. So the monasteries were portable as well. And the monastery could be built anywhere. It was, there was no rule about where you build a monastery when we look at them. Like this one, this beautiful one, Dragon's um, Monastery in Bhutan. 
I mean, it's gorgeous. Stuck up there on the side of that hill. The Chinese did the thing, same thing. They would put monasteries up on a sheer rock cliff. <laughs> Scare you to death to walk up there. The Tibetans, this one in Sri Lanka where this great outcrop, they put the monastery right on the top of this. They put them in out of way places, number one, because they wanted to have that kind of practice uh, privacy. But the monastery was free and it could be, it was a wonderful institution. It was for particularly people traveling it provided you with a hotel, with a spiritual place to practice, <clears throat> with a school for your children, with a safety deposit box that you could leave your goods and private things because the monks were absolutely uh, taking a vow of poverty. They wouldn't steal from you. You could spend the night in safety you could be treated for medical care. So these monasteries, which were so portable, served an enormous function for merchants. So in California, we have California missions, and they're an exact duplication of the Buddhist caravansary monasteries, one day apart, a place where the merchants could sleep they could put their children in school. They could get treated if they were sick. They had a place they could store their goods. When you read about the California missions, it's exactly what we read about when we talk about the Buddhist monastic institution that happened centuries before the Spanish brought that to California. So you can put monasteries in caves, in Thailand and Malaysia, you have monasteries that are actual in these huge caverns. You can put it under a mountain. You can just dig out a hole in the mountain. You can put it on top of the mountain. You can put it on the side of the mountain. You're free. There's no, there is no limitation that's placed on you. This to me is portability. This is what it looks like. It's differences. It's adapting to the local situation. But it's always assumed that it has the same authority wherever you are. And then we come to the present time. Um, let's play a little game for you. Do any of you know where these are? Do you recognize any of them? These are monasteries of today. When I say a monastery doesn't matter, these are what modern day Buddhist monasteries look like. In this one, in England, in Spain, Perth, Australia, uh, this is Pogon Shan in Shilai, no, it's not Shilai, uh, it's a smaller place, Kanye, Australia, Kanye, Australia, maybe Australia, uh, or New Zealand, one of the two. Russia. But this is the most interesting one. Where do you think this Buddhist monastery is? Anybody know? Rome. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The Buddhist monastery is so portable. You can put it anywhere in the world, anywhere. You can even put it in this city, which is totally the center of Roman Catholicism. And it's all right, you can put it there. 
there's no reason why you can't do it, and they do it. So you have English, you have Berkeley, <laughs> Japanese Buddhist temple in Berkeley. And this one, you may not know the, feel the significance of it that we would feel in the US. This is in Salt Lake City, the home of the Mormon tradition. This used to be a Mormon structure. The Buddhists have taken it over and redone the Mormon building into a Buddhist site in Salt Lake City of all places, about as remote as you can get. So when we look at the mountains, you look at Wutaishan, <clears throat> it has relics, the white stupa, it has monasteries, it has monks, it has nuns, it has Buddhist images, it has texts, it has places where Tibetans and Chinese live absolutely side by side with their buildings almost touching. The portability of Buddhism is fully seen and expressed when we look at those four mountains. We can understand them better, I think, if we see this idea of what's fixed and what's portable. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Korea, I'm interested in the kind of representing of the sacred place. <coughs> Let me authority to recognize the kind of representing, no matter it's legend or a story. If I want to get a degree in a prestige university of the Berkeley, I don't want to be bothered to learn the language of English. I wish to get a degree in Hong Kong. I probably were hoping you will set up a branch here. <laughs> but by using that case study, my question comes to you, that particular social context, like, because for example, we keep thinking about this portable element. You keep thinking it's a, a, the key element of spreading. Yes. And I'm thinking if the case of Wu Tai Shan, for example, how is possible you can even have this kind of reinvention of a holy mountain in Korea, or Da San something? Oh, Da San. Oh, Da San. Is, yeah, that's for me <coughs> the most difficult case to be cracked because human being and I understand, monk travels through trade, um, very similar case with the Christianity, missionary, and so on. Temple, yes, that's important um, place to, you know, to take in so many meanings, teachings, practice. But mountain, I want to know more. How can that case can be the case? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, <coughs> Well, you know, there are a number of uh, situations in which replicas are used in place of the real thing. And you go to the replica. Um, recently, this young couple took a class of mine, and they said, we just got married on the Eiffel Tower. And I said, wow, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> You can go to the Eiffel Tower and get married. Well, yes, but it's the Eiffel Tower in Las Vegas. <laughs> they have a replica of the Eiffel Tower in Las Vegas, and you can go to the top of that, and it's an exact replica of the Paris Eiffel Tower. But from their perspective, they didn't say that at first. They just said, we got married in the Eiffel Tower because it's the replica is good as the real thing for them. They got the same pictures. Um, China has many replicas that people go to. Um, China is, is culturally has always been really good at making replicas. They can make a, something look so real that you really have to look at it a long time and be an expert to determine that it's not the real thing. And that includes watches, <laughs> everything else. But so from one perspective, the fact that people, it's like Wu Tai Shan. The Tibetans and the Mongols say, if you go to Wu Tai Shan, you don't have to go to Lhasa. It works just as well you get the same effect. And so uh, you have many examples that I just only gave a few, but you have many examples where the replica serves that function. I agree with you that I probably put more focus on the portability because that's more of the history of Buddhism than fixity. But Buddhism did become fixed. Buddhism became fixed sometime uh, around 16th century. And for hundreds of years, it was fixed to nation state and language. You had Tibetan Buddhism, Thai Buddhism, Cambodian Buddhism. <laughs> Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. You had all the forms of Buddhism had a, an adjective in front of them. And they didn't interact. And so in 1956, <clears throat> the 
big world council of Theravada monks in um, what was then called Rangoon, when they brought them all together, it was very rare. But they had to build a building especially set up so that they didn't put monks with different robes together because each robe was its, a national robe. The Cambodians had their robe, the Sri Lankans had theirs, the Thai had, and they still do, and the Burmese had their, their robes, so they, they were all different. It's only in the last few decades, I think, that this nationalistic limitation of Buddhism has broken loose again and Buddhism became portable in after, particularly after World War II, so that you had Thai monks going all over the world, Taiwanese monks going all over, nuns going all over the world. All of the immigrants that began to pour out and travel, everybody who was traveling who was Buddhist, they carried with them Buddhism. And so Buddhism has lost that nationalistic trait to some degree, it's still present. But for a long time it was really fixed. That's where Buddhism just stayed. And it, it wasn't spreading. It was fixed in those language and national boundaries. What global Buddhism will mean for the tradition, nobody knows yet. but Buddhism in, for better or for worse, is becoming global. <clears throat> so you can go to Buddhist monasteries in Santiago, Rio de Janeiro, the Congo, Rome, <laughs> anywhere you want, and you are going to find a global form of it still tied to its nationality because that's who has to run it or the immigrant groups. So it's a very interesting time to study the new portability. I, I think of it as the new portability of Buddhism of today where it has broken free and has begun to spread. I do not feel that the uh, main story about Buddhism today is the introduction to European and North Americans. The real story of Buddhism still today uh, lies with the immigrant communities. By far, they are the largest number of Buddhists everywhere. So that while everybody wants to define success as how many Europeans can you convert? I believe that the real success of Buddhism lies in whether or not it can keep its present populations Buddhist. That's going to be the determining factor. And I really do feel that for the future, the real future of Buddhism lies with China. That's going to be the determining factor. It is already the case that there are more Chinese Buddhists than almost the rest of the world put together. So you can't really study Buddhism in the future, even at its global level, without understanding Chinese forms of it, and that's going to get even stronger with every passing day, I'm convinced. But thank you for your question and comment. I, I may get carried away with portability. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture, Professor. Um, I actually have a question for you and your um, Chinese.
understand that well. Um, because my background is not from Jewish religion study or humanity studies, Buddhism, anything like that. So it's all, all new information for me in the past two nights. Um, I just got really interesting, interested in terms of when you're talking about the relics. Is that how you say that? Relics? Or I don't even know how to say it. Um, yes, relics. It relaxes. Um, and Shari. So, because uh, the way I got into you know the Buddhism is going with the families into the temples and pray and read all this um, sing jing or jing gang jing all this thing, yeah. you know. And uh, um, but and also I got told that when you let's say how how many legs you can see, and this is kind of like your special ability in terms of to see how close you are with the Buddhism, all, all this kind of information I I got told when I was a kid. So, um, but when you're talking about like when people take real serious about, uh, in terms of like, let's like say transport, when we like from somewhere to Hong Kong and it got, it got into a big event of this, and this got me all of a sudden thinking about like what we do nowadays in terms of worship or this uh, thing, the physical thing we can see, in, like the image, like the relax, and like all this um, thing we can physically see. But it seems to be counterindicated with what I read through all this, um, like the, the, I don't know how to say it, the classical literature like the Xin Jing because it all tells you don't worry about what you say, it's all it's not real and then let, let it go, you know, and don't fixate it on something. So I, I just don't I just got the confused. It's it's are we doing wrong in terms of like taking serious or or putting all this meaningful thinking of all this um, relax or other stuff we can physically say. So what we are doing nowadays, is it actually against what the Buddha really actually want us to do? So that, this is my question. I don't know if I made it clear or, yes, no, I, or not. I understand your concern. Uh, I'm not concerned, I'm just well, curious. Well, curious, okay. <laughs> Buddhism is a very, very complex tradition, and nobody owns it. Nobody owns it. I really worry when somebody comes to me and says, I have true Orthodox Buddhism. I know what it's all about, and what I do is what it's all about. And from my study of Buddhism, I don't know what to say to them because it's, it is a very complex tradition and no one group practices it all. No one person practices all the things that there are in it. No one book has ever described everything that's there and everything which is done and never will be. And the Buddhists have always had debates. Buddhism is built on debates. They don't mind a debate. They say debate as long as you want, because if you really debate, anything which comes out of a debate that you work with long enough will be much more powerful and firm than something which is just taken without a debate. You got to test it. You got to see if it works for me. So I think for people who ask this question about, sometimes they come to me with, you know, well, how shall I practice? And it's like a student who comes to you and says, what shall I write my dissertation on? And I say, you realize that part of education is to find out yourself what it is that you are so interested in and that you love so much that you would like to spend hours and hours and days of your life working on it. 
And so I would say to most Buddhists who ask, or people who ask that question, it, it's Buddhism allows you a kind of freedom to say, what is it that you really want? What is it that gives you a sense of satisfaction, calmness, assurance? And the Buddhists have one test for whatever you decide. If you want to know, well, did I make the right decision? <laughs> Maybe I made the wrong decision. If you made the right decision, the Buddhists say, you will have compassion. Anything you do, if you ask yourself, is this the right thing? Ask yourself the next question. Does it give me a sense of compassion? And the Buddhist texts say, if whatever you've decided doesn't, makes you angry, makes you upset, whatever, then it's like, I loved it when the Dalai Lama came to Berkeley and gave this talk, and he spoke about a lot of social issues and political issues, and when it was all over, he, he said, now, look, if I said anything to you which upsets you or makes you angry or gives you a stomach ache or just gives you a headache and disturbs you, then just forget it. It has nothing to do with you. Forget it. What should come from whatever experience I have, if it's the right thing, this is what the Buddhists say, is compassion. And that's, that's the test. So uh, when you work with students and work with yourself, it's like, what should I write my next article on? Where should I put my energy? And I have so little energy left, I said, well, I've got to be really sure. This has to be something I really want to do. So after I had taught for about 25 years, I realized I was getting bored with my teaching. And I figured, if I'm bored, they must be bored silly. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I went home. I went into my study with big black plastic bags. And I threw away all of my notes. All of them. I threw away all of my class assignments. I threw away all of the outlines. I threw it all away. And I went into the class, and I come to you to say the same. I went into my class, and I said, look, you can get a book and read a lot of this. I don't have to tell you the story of how the Buddha had four sights and four noble truths. There are a thousand books out there waiting for you. Just read it. I'm only going to talk to you about something which I find interesting. And if you want to join me in that, fine. If you don't, I understand it. <laughs> and teaching became alive for me again. And I've never tried to save notes since. And I only wish that I could go back to a lot of the students who took all those notes 30, 40 years ago and say, I wish you'd throw them away, because most of that I don't believe anymore. I change my mind about Buddhism all the time. I realize that it's like uh, when I was really thinking a lot about this at one point, I came to the conclusion that in one sense, everything I've ever said about Buddhism is wrong from one perspective. You can always find an alternative position somewhere to anything I've said. So you can't get it right. You just can't. But I do firmly believe you can be less wrong. 
And that's what you should aim for. Just be a little less wrong than I was yesterday. A little less wrong than I was but even an hour ago. That's all I can ask for out of life. So when there is some idea of a perfect answer, the complete story of Buddhism, the, the totality of it, you can't have that and have a living tradition. It would destroy it. Would absolutely destroy it if that was so, I think. It is only because it's a living tradition and it's in the, over long stretches of time and in many different places all over the world. As long as that's the case, this complex and wonderfully rich tradition will always perplex us, will always leave us guessing. We will always have to struggle very hard. So my advice to you is just be a little less wrong if you can and never expect perfection. <laughs> Not a very good idea. I think.